Good afternoon, uh, colleagues attending the conference. I hope you are enjoying the conference, you're learning, you're interacting, and you're networking. Um, I'm going to give you a very brief uh, presentation on case management of COVID-19. My name is Dr. Annette Alenyong Gavirano. I'm an emergency physician. I uh, work um, with the case management pillar of COVID-19, specifically the emergency medical services uh, pillar. I've also uh, got experience in, in, um, in managing COVID patients uh, in Kampala, in Malako, and also um, done a few uh, patient reviews in some of the regional referral hospital CTUs. So I'm going to give you a standard presentation that we train under COVID case management pillar. Uh, it is, a, it is a, a presentation that is derived from the national guidelines of COVID case management for the country. I know the guidelines are, are now in their third edition and uh, there are a lot of changes in, 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 um, in case management, but there are also a lot of interesting academic discussions and reviews on drugs and, and other therapies that may or may not be beneficial, may or may not be useful, or may or may not be affordable for our Ugandan, may or may not really have impact on your patient's uh, outcome. So what I'm going to give you is what is recommended cutting across the country, and it is a management that we hope, can, not that we hope, that should be delivered in any part of Uganda, uh, right from Kampala, where we have higher resources, all the way to the regions where they may have uh, fewer resources, may not be as resource uh, as well resourced as, as some facilities uh, in the capital. But the guidelines and, and the protocols that are uh, in this presentation should cut a course. So look at an introduction, just a, a brief background of COVID, which I know you all know. We'll also look at some non-pharmacologic management or, and public health interventions for COVID. We'll then go into pharmacologic interventions that are recommended. We'll look at the discharge protocol. We'll have a bit of post-COVID um, disease and, 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 and also look at home-based care. So we know the roots of, of COVID, really. You have an infected person, you have an environment that allows uh, transmission to happen, and that may be a reduced distance um, between the people or um, someone coughing out aerosols. And on the other side, you have a susceptible host who has not protected his points of entry, his eyes, nose, or mouth. So the clinical presentation, and I don't like that. <laughs> Put it in this way. That um, thermal scan reminds me of what happens every time you enter a building in the city and people think they're screening. But I will leave that for when we talk about screening. You remind me of the, the, the thermal scan. But let's look at, at symptoms of COVID. And, and COVID, like um, vi many viruses, causes symptoms in, in different systems. So, uh, uh, and this may be a very, very academic approach. And you just look at the patient from the head down to the feet or the other flips, the other side is to look at system by system. So going from the head down approach, headache, um, congestion on our running nose or loss of sense of smell or taste for your ENT, a sore throat, down to the lungs, difficulty in breathing, to the mass body, fatigue, muscle, or body ache, fever, chills, uh, to the GIT or down to the tummy, you have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. These are your really common symptoms. Uh, or of course, we all know that there are extremes of this, but this is usually what your patients will, co will, will complain of. And symptoms may appear two to 14 days after after exposure to the virus on average about uh, five days. So the manifestations of COVID, we know that COVID is primarily a lung disease, but they are extra pulmonary that uh, manifestations, things that appear beyond the lungs. So apart from the quick symptoms patients will tell you, there are also uh, things um, that we have, these are really signs, things that we see in patients or things that we diagnose uh, with COVID patients. So again, taking it from top, um, top down. So neurologically, you have headache, dizziness, encephalopathy, acusia, myalgia, anosmia, stroke, uh, dermatologically, uh, the patients who come with petechia uh, or, you know, 
various uh, descriptions of rash. You also have patients who may have cardiac patholo cardiac conditions, arrhythmias, MIs. I remember there's an incredibly uh, an incredible case of a young man who was right from. Uh, uh, one of the CTUs, I think Nambole CTU came in with worsening chest pain, diaphoretic COVID, under COVID, on treatment for COVID, typical picture of an MI, and indeed his ECG showed uh, an MI. So COVID can have very uh, in, impressive um, cardiac findings. Thromboembolism, of course, uh, that one is always on social media. Uh, and unfortunately, people only call, think it's because of vaccines and we often forget that COVID itself as a disease uh, predisposes you to to, 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 to uh, embolic uh, thromboembolic disease. Um, the other, of course, is hepatic, elevated uh, liver, uh, um, elevated, um, liver enzymes uh, and bilirubin, renal, often you'll see evidence of acute kidney injury, uh, and that may be uh, the disease, but also how you manage the patient, proteinuria, hematuria, there's also endocrine, hyperglycemia, very common, and perhaps um, the beginning of, of the pandemic, most people kept referring patients as newly diagnosed diabetic, with COVID uh, and slowly as we got more knowledgeable, uh, it came out that you know one of the big end, uh, endocrine manifestations or effects of COVID is, is uh, hyperglycemia. And so we and so came many protocols of how to, to manage the, uh, the, the high sugar levels. Also diabetic acidosis, but uh, again, you know, this is where you, your body is actually producing acid, which has um, uh, different protocols for, for managing it also. You have uh, GI um, where you have diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, uh, anorexia. So, so this, the severity spectrum of COVID is, is, is really wide and, and we are very lucky that um, the case fatality ratio, case fatality rate for COVID is low because a lot of patients get, um, you know, the, the better part of the spectrum. If we had had a pandemic like Ebola that hits 80, 90% uh, fatality, uh, perhaps a big, a big, percentage of this world would have been wiped out and we, we probably would have been living one of those movies that will those apocalypse apocalypse like movies where humanity has been reduced to 10 percent um, and and we are really lucky that COVID doesn't have a very high fatality and that is because most of the patients are asymptomatic mild or moderate and asymptomatic or presymptomatic infection sometimes they're not asymptomatic per se they they will turn symptomatic some patients will turn symptomatic but at the time they're seen they they don't have any symptoms and we went through the symptoms already so what that simply means is that a patient has a, a covid test that is positive but has no complaints at all uh, the ne next is the mild illness, and this may be varied, you know. There's this very funny um, um, clip uh, someone sent me of, of uh, one of the NTV journalists who said, was complaining about uh, uh, doctors when we're managing COVID, and he said he had severe, severe COVID, and, and the person he was interviewing said, well, what did you have? He said, my body was hurting so much, I had a headache, I had a sore throat, um, and fever and I was sleeping and I slept the whole time. I went to a clinic, they told me I'm, I'm mild and I went back home and yet I had severe disease. I couldn't even move. And I was like, hmm, interesting. And so, you know, people's perception of severity different from our perception. So keep this in mind when you're counseling patients and explain to them just how bad it can get and what your worries are and why you are saying they have mild illness. So fever, cough, sore throat, malaise. And, and when I had COVID, I had, I had this. I, my muscles were, were feeling like someone had minced my, minced my muscles, I had fever, um, um, and yeah, and, and a sore throat. I fortunately had no shortness of breath, no dyspnea, no abnormal imaging, so I was mild. Moderate disease is, is where we now start having uh, evidence of, of, of disease in the lungs. And so your saturation is no longer as nice as it, it should be. It's, it's, you know, it's not abnormal, but it is above 94, 94 and above. Uh, uh, and you have evidence of respiratory tract disease. And this is where people, 
may even have cracks if you listen, uh, but they have uh, shortness of breath, they have cough, and now the disease is actually showing you that, well, I am now in the lung. Severe disease is when your SATs now drop below 94, your PF threshold is less than 300, and PF is partial pressure of oxygen. And this is if you have a blood gas machine where you can check your partial pressure of oxygen to how much uh, FiO2 you're giving the patient. If it's less than 300, if your respiratory rate is more than 30, or if you do imaging and the lung infiltrates more than 50%. From severe, you move to critical. So respiratory failure, septic shock, multi-organ dysfunction. These are very, very sick patients with the patients who should be managed in ICU. So there's a very nice um, um, research that you can actually download very easily on Google. And, and I encourage you guys to download it uh, if you haven't read it uh, um, by Zhu et al. that um, uh, came out last year on, on timing of complications on, in adult COVID patients in China. And they just looked through their database and, and looked at patient uh, complications and, and the periods when you generally expect them to come on that, that disease um, timeline. And you can see something like fever is like from day one to day 12, 13, uh, cough maybe throughout up to like three weeks. Um, dyspnea, patients who were admitted in ICU, when were they most likely to be admitted? And, and sepsis, RDS, when did it set in? And, and for me, what, what I pick and what I would encourage guys to pick from, from a paper like this is that your patients get really sick in their second week. In the first week, especially patients on home-based care, patients who come in the first week, you check them, everyone is happy. Oh, I have COVID, but I'm not feeling sick. Uh, but look at this chart. Look at when bad things start happening. It's usually in the second week. So this is where we need to be very, 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 very aggressive as far as monitoring patients, even when we tell them they should stay home. The second week, if your patient is in second week, you need to be very alert and you need to pick out these complications very early so that you avert them becoming bad. Of course, a big thing to mention there is sepsis, uh, ARDS, and all the other uh, uh, hectic um, uh, acute kidney injury, cardiac injury, all the uh, multi-organ uh, effects of COVID. The other is, is and a big one really, and, and this is why we end up in a lot of ICUs and why um, uh, pulmonologists and respiratory physicians uh, globally have become a big part of managing COVID is because of the big um, respiratory effects, a respiratory failure and patients going into ARDS. And the, the definition for that really doesn't change uh, based on your timing, um, within a week of a known clinical insult or new worsening respiratory symptoms, you're just imaging um, bilateral pacifications and, and, and your edema. And, and, and in managing such patients, of course, um, a respiratory failure, which is not fully explained by any other obvious cause, uh, commonly cardiac failure or fluid overdose. Uh, and often here, it's good to use point of care testing, uh, which I, I, I know you did on, on Wednesday for your pre-conference pre workshops, uh, to ex exclude other possible explanations to your patient's presentation. And of course, the big thing with RDS is oxygenation and how much oxygen is, is, is getting into your patient. So, and for, without you, grade your patient as mild, moderate, or severe based on their PF ratio again. Uh, and these are standard definitions for ARDS. Uh, of course, there's also bedside. You can do bedside hypo hypoxemia grading, which is same mild, moderate, uh, severe, or critical. And, and uh, based on, and, and this is Actually, um, for, for what I often do with, even when I manage COVID with EMS transfers, I base, I use bedside hypoxemia grading quite a lot. Uh, and what modality is the patient getting oxygen? Is it nasal prongs or a simple face mask, which is the SFM, or non rebreather mask, or high flow, or CPAP, or NIV? Uh, what are their stats on that? And, and it helps you to, to be able to, to grade just how severe your patient is. So we go to screening and diagnosis, and now I remember that thermos can. So screening, so when you go to a mall and, and the guys ask you to hand sanitize and then flash that, that um, thermos can at your wrist or your forehead, that is not screening. That is, is something else. And I often say we call that something else. So screening as speaking specifically 
and at, at, from a medical perspective is done by a health worker who is trained to screen and uses a screening tool and they go through a checklist. If you look at a lot of our data, not uh, the biggest complaints with our patients is cough. So if that guy is flashing your gun and you're coughing in his face, he's not, most times he's not even going to think, oh wait, this patient is actually coughing despite them having a normal temperature. It could still be COVID. No, it's going to focus on you coming, coming from a jog and your temperature has probably spiked or coming from standing under the sun or something. But it's going to be, I don't know what to call it. It is not screening. So let us practice proper screening and have a health worker with a screening tool who goes through a checklist that looks at common symptoms and checks the symptom, symptomatology and marks the patient uh, based on that. So WHO has a clear uh, definition for COVID. The, the suspect case, who do you think may have COVID? Who is probable, who is a probable case and who's a confirmed case? And we also have a safe definition in our COVID um, handbook. And I'm hoping by now we all know uh, who, who are suspect cases. In the beginning, it was challenging when we were going through our epidemiologic phases, when we started from you know, no case to scattered cases, to clusters, and finally to community transmission, which is really where the whole world is at the moment. But if you have the symptoms now, cough, fever, general fatigue, you really are a suspect in Uganda. And then a, a probable case is, of course, if you have the symptoms under contact, or you know, a confirmed case, um, or um, you are a suspect with chest imaging, most likely chest X-ray, because at the moment now, if you have CT scan findings of COVID with, with clear criteria, you're admitted as COVID for as long as you have the, the signs and symptoms of it. And, and there are some, of course, pathognomonic features of COVID, like loss of sense of smell. They do happen with other diseases, but at the moment, if you have cough for three days and then you can't smell anything uh, with the way that where the world is at the moment, it, it is a probable case of COVID. We also have the unexplained death of an adult who, um, has respiratory distress, um, again, we are in state four. So if you have uh, heavy respiratory symptoms and then you die before you can be test tested, you are probable case until you are, of course, tested. So the common diagnostic methods, and, and I'm going through this, uh, and I, I do know it, the, the presentation is focusing a lot on treatment, but we need to understand um, or remind ourselves or revise some of these concepts before we go into the treatment. So you can't do the common testing is, um, um, of course, the viral nucleic acid, um, uh, at the RNA testing. Typically, if you have an, an active infection, the specimen is from your um, upper airways your upper airways, that's your oral or nasal, or even lower. The lower, of course, the better, but you can't get a, a, a regular person and tell them, I'm going to get a sample from your trachea, from a trachea. That is going to be your sick patients in ICU uh, where you do your routine trachea aspirates. So considerations for this, uh, of course, um, you need uh, kids available. You may have false negatives from improper sampling or handling, especially in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, people are not very good with the tests. We're all learning and, and sometimes we get a false positive and then the guys come in and then go really deeper or get like a tracheal aspirate in an intubated patient. And then you have um, a positive test. And then the diagnosis again changes and the management plan. Um, also, uh, you have to remember that your RNA test may not be detectable uh, about 14 days uh, following onset of illness. And this probably explained why in the beginning when the country was at, 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 um, at uh, containment phase of response, where we're trying to contain the spread, uh, we kept everyone, we kept everyone in facilities where we would start testing towards day 14, uh, and once you're negative, you are discharged. And that completely changed once we understood the disease better. Uh, there's also the antibody tests and um, clear infection. Is it, it clear, usually post-infection to confirm that you did mount antibodies. Uh, uh, and this can be from, and the sample can be serum or plasma. Considerations for these, um, uh, it, it's, it's, these are really good uh, surveillance tools and, and research 
um, yeah, and you may have false positives from cross-reactivity. And if you're uncertain, you may have to, to use another test. The antigen test, of course, is, is quicker, uh, cheaper, but of course less sensitive. But it's, it's, it's something that we're doing a lot of. It helps you if, if your patient, patient has symptoms, you have like 15 minutes rapid test and, and you know if your symptoms, based on your symptoms, I, I think you're probable case. I do a test 15 minutes later. And like when we're doing the RNA, you know, this PCR test and it's taking two, two days, three days, four days to come out. And you can't make a decision on what to do with the patient. Should they go to COVID ICU, non-COVID ICU? The non-COVID ICU says, we can't admit without um, PCR. The COVID ICU says, well, we can't admit without PCR results and you're stuck. So some of these tests uh, used very well can be very useful. Of course, CT imaging is one of the big things we're using now, especially in, 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 in Greater Kampala where we have uh, easier access than in the region. So if you're listening in from, from the regions, if you can get CT within your region, uh, for COVID patients, even if your tests are showing negative, but you have a high index of suspicion, you may need to check a uh, city and you'll see this typical ground glass uh, opacifications uh, for COVID. So let's look at the, the treatment actually. So there's non-pharmacological, there's our beautiful face mask and we should all yambala mask, guy. Right? Wear your mask, COVID. And, and the past, if anything, the last wave showed us that um, um, you know, it's not just the elderly. Yes, more elderly uh, died, but also young people. We lost colleagues, young doctors, one much older or younger than us, or young nurses, lab techs. It, it was quite scary. So wear your mask, uh, uh, wash hands with soap and water, maintain social distance, um, practice respiratory etiquette, uh, avoid crowds and, and concentrated air, high volume concentrated areas. And you can see that our conference that we often really used to like meeting and chatting and having lunch together this year, uh, look at the type of conference we are having because we are practicing uh, non-pharmacologic preventive measures. So we are having a hybrid conference with a lot of it on remote using um, uh, an app that allows us to still uh, network. So let's look at medical interventions. First of all, before you do any medical interventions, you need to understand PPE. Uh, level one PPE really is 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 you. Um, the setting it's really community. I'm not really encouraging everyone now is really to be at level one PPE. So everyone face mask. That's it. You're not interacting with patients. Um, people we meet on the street are not interacting with patients, but they should be in, in a face mask. So that's our level one. Uh, level two, patient interaction without contact. If you're seated at reception, maybe, uh, or the ambulance drivers, or you're screening, but you're not going to be in close contact, you wear your work clothes, your scrubs, um, and disposable facial mask. This is where we mostly function, level three and level four. The difference really here is, is, is the, uh, the use of an N95 uh, for level four. And you must, if you're working, especially in ICU, and I know I'm speaking to uh, people who work with, um, with very sick patients. So if you're working with a patient where there's a high risk of aerosol general, gener, generation, suctioning, the ICU, like you walk into ICU and you're really in aerosolization zone. Someone is being nebulized there, someone is suctioning there, someone is bugging, someone is on tip up there. It's, 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 it's just aerosol zone. So you must always be in level four PPE. And the big thing about level four PPE is getting your N95 well sealed onto your face and your and your eyes and your eyes well covered. So now we went through the different disease presentations. We're going to look at the, and I know there might be some arguments and, and discussions, but this is what the, the guidelines are, are saying uh, for the country. So we did define what a mild case is and treatment here is of course this, if this patient is at home, uh, probably this is a patient who really will meet home-based care criteria unless they are at risk for severe disease. So your elderly people, uh, uh, people with uh, comorbidities, spiritual comorbidities that cannot be managed at home, you need to get them in facilities for facility isolation. And, and the treatment here is really still supportive. Adults, children, it is all supportive. And the mainstay of the support treatment really is managing um, uh, the fever if they're there. Uh, and if they have any chest pain, uh, the paracetamol should be able to sort that. So standard treatment regimen, one gram eight hourly 
uh, um, vitamin C is no longer recommended. Uh, it has no therapeutic benefit. It tastes nice. It does, but it is, it makes people feel like they are taking, I don't know, people like vitamin C, but it, it, it has no therapeutic benefit. Uh, give vitamin D uh, for those who have demonstrated deficiency, not just routinely, uh, or people who are elderly and you know that they you know, they are indoors and they are at risk of not coming out into the beautiful sun and, and converting vitamin D. Um, zinc is still uh, on our guideline, uh, 20 milligrams daily for 14 days. For children, you also give uh, paracetamol, weight based as you know, 15 milligrams per kg, uh, eight hourly. Uh, moderate COVID, um, again, we said these are patients with pneumonia, Remember we said this is when the disease now starts telling you, well, I'm now in the lungs, but it's not severe. So they may have cough, may have a, just a bit of tachypnea, but no, no, it's, they're not severe, right? And for these, um, the guidelines are that you can start azithromycin or amoxyl zinc, vitamin D again, um, as, as described, vitamin C is no longer recommended. Uh, children, uh, similar, uh, again, weight and age-based uh, treatment regimen. Um, monitoring for mild and moderate. So these are patients who can actually get worse. And if you remember that um, um, diagram, those charts by Zhu et al in China, uh, it, it tells you when to expect deterioration. So you need to monitor these patients. Don't say, well, you came on day three, well, you're mild, you're going to stay mild. In the next week, you may end up admitting that patient in, in ICU. So you need to monitor Monitor, monitor these patients. Patients with severe, disease, severe uh, COVID, uh, these are patients who will require ox um, oxygen 100%. So we said um, these are hypoxic uh, and, 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 and there's, you know, especially with the, there's, there's a lot to, to oxygen therapy and, and I'm hoping there's a, a session on oxygen therapy for COVID so you, you understand your targets and, and, and and we don't ch don't just 100, don't just 98, don't just 96. Actually, many times you, you re really might just need um, SP2 of 90 with a calm patient, and and that's it. And 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 you you you're happy there, okay? So um, zithromycin here is no longer recommended. Uh, you start um, quamoxiclav 625 twice a day for seven days if a patient is able to take orally. If not, you give them KEF uh, IV two grams daily, again for seven days, uh, and get them on oxygen, uh, and these are patients who will need uh, steroids. So um, children, um, uh, of course, if you're giving steroids, other things have to come in, monitor their sugars, uh, again, Vitamin D, we said you give it as per as per as per recommendation. Recommendation people you think will have low levels uh, from your assessment of their history, elderly in the house all the time, or people who you've tested and they they actually have uh, a deficiency. These are your very sick patients, and you need to monitor these patients. The patients who can get critical and require ICU. So um, these are patients constant monitoring. You need a bedside nurse to always check on them. You need doctor reviews. And guys, this is, these are not your to continue treatment to the Monday, you next review the patient on Wednesday uh, afternoon. No, these are patients that need at least two, 12 hour visits by a doctor with decision making. Uh, critical patients are patients with your ARDS, um, uh, and again, these are patients who have multiple organ uh, involvement, and these are your critical patients that go into ICU. Yes, the percentage is small. It is, uh, I don't remember our current uh, percentage as a country, but it's still about 5 to 7% of these patients. If you have a blood gas, you can grade it. Uh, um, using your PF ratio, uh, um, mild, moderate, and severe. So if you have the higher your PF ratio, really the better for you. So if your PF ratio 200 to 300, 201 really to 300, that's mild RDS. If it's 100 to 200, that's your moderate. And then you have your severe where your PF ratio is, is less than 100. It means basically you're giving this guy too much oxygen, but there's barely any of it going into, into uh, circulation. If you don't have it, you can still use your SF ratio uh, uh, and you ensure that you titrate your, your FiO2 uh, 
um, and then you can do your ratio. How much how much oxygen do you have to give this patient? And you can do um, a SpO2 to FiO2 ratio. If it's between two thirty, about two thirty to three fifteen, it's 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 moderate ARDS. If it's um, less than one, if it's it's mild. Uh, mild ARDS if it's 236 to 315, moderate if it's between 151 to about 230, and if it's less than 150, then it is uh, severe. And this is something we can all do. So uh, how do you manage these patients? So uh, patients like these should be managed in an ICU, an appropriate ICU with um, appropriate medical expertise. And, and of course, triaging patients for ICU, there is, if you look at our uh, COVID guidelines for the country, uh, Annex 1.2 uh, has a clear triage for ICU. And, and, and I encourage you guys to interact with that triage. It's a very good triage tool that helps you identify which patient will actually benefit from ICU. So ICU is not for every patient who is critical. There are some patients who, no matter what you do, uh, you know are going to succumb. But there are patients who, I, I, when identified early and, and aggressively managed in ICU, have very good uh, benefit. So who will benefit the most from ICU? And in our setting where we have uh, low, um, you know, we have few resources, perhaps these are things we need to take more seriously so that we ration our resources to be most beneficial. To be very sad to put an 85 year old with critical COVID with multiple organ failure uh, uh, because the, the request for admission came in 30 minutes before the 30 year old um, pregnant mother who has COVID. And you say, well, we got this one first, but this 30 year old may benefit more from this patient. They have no comorbidities, they're young, for some reason they got severe uh, so critical COVID disease. So those are things that of course need a senior input uh, for you to be able to determine, but there are things that you need to do. And when patients are in, in ICU, of course, the, the discussion between the type of ventilation, is it going to be non-invasive? Is it going to be invasive? And how are you going to do it? Um, and, and for many patients now in the country, high flow nasal cannulas are available. They consume a lot of oxygen, but they also save our patients. So try your high flow. If it fails, you can go to non-invasive ventilation. Uh, then if that fails, you can intubate, but intubation is something that needs to be done early. Don't intubate someone because SATs are now 20 to 30% and you just must intubate now. Intubation is beneficial when it's done very early so that you avoid the patient deteriorating to that irreversible stage. So um, uh, again, the, the decisions here are, are very clear and you need to learn when, when you say someone has failed on high flow, it's not as simple as saying, uh, well, they're not, the SATs are not going up. Sometimes it's, it's many other things breathing, a lot of things you look at, there are uh, partial pressure of oxygen if you can, do, if you can get it, but uh, you consider a lot of things um, to, to escalate these patients. And some patients you may decide not to escalate beyond a certain uh, levels based on other things, frailty, frailty score, these are things we know, but they're very important when you're managing patients in, in ICU. So last year, um, uh, 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 around December, someone told me a case of a lady who since COVID was declared uh, in March in Uganda, had been taking dexamethasone tablets and that was now December. So how many months had she taken COVID uh, dexamethasone? And she appeared with all the endocrine complications you can think of with taking dexamethasone, we're taking steroids. So steroids have clear uh, indication in, in patients who have COVID. If a patient is not on oxygen, for example, they have no business with, with dexamethasone. So uh, steroids can, can cause very many complications, elevation in blood pressure, adrenal cortical insufficiency. Uh, they reduce your, your immunity and increase susceptibility to any other infections. Um, they can damage your optic nerve. They can cause left ventricular uh, free will rupture in, in patients who have a re recent MI. We already said these guys get clots. They can have, get an MI from COVID and then you can... So, you need to think very carefully about, uh, about dexamethasone. Uh, it's not very benign and it's not something you just prescribe anyhow. So uh, if we manage patients, uh, how do we then uh, discharge them? So the, the 
guidelines are very clear on um, discharge and the isolation criteria. So patients who are asymptomatic um, or mild and not severely immune compromised can de, de isolate them after 10 days, even from home based care. Uh, and if they've been having fever, uh, at least 24 hours fever free without using any uh, fever reducing medication. And also if their symptoms have improved, not resolved. You saw that uh, study that was done, uh, cough can go up to 21, 20, 21 days. So if you've taken 10 days and I'm just coughing a bit less, I'm not short of breath and I can be discharged from, from isolation really. Uh, uh, also the patients are not transmitting anymore. And I remember when we switched from 14 days to 10 days, uh, not 14 days actually, from a negative PCR to 10 days. It caused a lot of chaos, caused a lot of confusion for patients. Some patients were immediately happy, but some patients were concerned. You are doing PCR, I've not had a PCR done. Explaining to them that mind ch mindset change was very uh, difficult. So if you have, if patients who are asymptomatic or only mild to moderate, but are severely immune compromised, this is the second group. The first group are not severely, the second group. So you need, you, you may consider taking a negative PCR for these patients. Um, 10 days since symptoms first set or since their first, um, or since the date of their first positive uh, diagnostic test. And then the rest is really the same. So these are patients you may actually consider doing a discharge PCR. So at least 24 hours uh, fever free without medi fever medication or uh, if symptoms have improved. It is not resolved. I don't want to go say there must be no cough, no. It, should, it can't be there, but it is, it is improved. Uh, and then see patients who develop severe to critical illness at any point, regardless of their immune status. And these are patients also you may need um, at least a, 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 a discharge PCR for them. And you can start doing it from, from day 10. Um, Post-COVID lung disease, long COVID. So you've seen patients and in many uh, hospitals, actually the current uh, government recommendation is that um, all regional referral hospitals should at least have, well, these are the discussions that should all have um, a post-COVID clinic because many of these patients have persisting symptoms. Some of them get depressed, um, and studies have been done and she was like 14, about 14% um, depressed, 34% uh, are still coughing, uh, 53 still uh, breathless, 69 still fatigued. And, and, and they looked at, uh, and this is a study from 384 people who are, who are followed up for a median of 54 days. So, you know, 50, 54, about 50 to 55 days after discharge, people are still complaining of some of these things. So you, 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 they need to come back to a post-COVID clinic. Don't say, oh, well, we sent you out of the CTU, so you're no longer part of, of COVID. No, you need to have a clinic established to be able to follow up these days. And when they assess these people, actually 87% of them felt that a follow-up assessment was very useful. And finally, home-based care, uh, 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 and especially to my friends in the regions and in Kampala where we did home-based care. Not so well, and we, we had so many adverse events from home-based care, including patients becoming critical at home, or in some instances, even dying at home. So it's a community thing, really. You need the VH, village COVID task force notified. The VHT should do the follow-up. The primary level facility for that patient should be aware of the patient. The referral health facility needs to know how many people within their referral coverage area of home-based care. The EMS system needs a plan for evacuation in this patient and the district task force. So it's not just you, lone doctor, saying, well, I'll manage you at home. And off you go. This whole structure needs to be in place to support and uh, patients need to be linked to care. Once they have a positive test, you need to assess them for home-based care. If they don't meet home-based care criteria, please, please, please put them in facilities. Recently, I interacted with a, a, a case of a 101-year-old who died in home-based care. Really, what business does a 101-year-old with comorbidities with a positive COVID test have at home. Let them be in a facility where they can be supported. We know that they're already a high risk group, but improving their chances means putting them in a facility where they can receive better support. Um, this is just um, a, a, a simple algorithm, a documentation algorithm for home-based care, but essentially we all there, uh, there's a big team that has roles 
uh, and, and that needs to track patients at home based care. They are not alone at home dying. There has to be a system to monitor them and evacuate them early. So watch out for symptom worsening, uh, temperature, uh, check sats, and we encourage people, especially in home based care, if they can afford to have a pulse oximeter and learn how to use it. There are people who have had such 80s, then they call you when such the 60s, we need an ambulance. When did you notice a problem? Yesterday, such were in the 80s. So people need to know what to monitor for and when to escalate or call for help. And um, that's really it. These are mild patients, so they are treatment with the same as for mild patients. So I'd like to thank um, the home based care, uh, uh, sorry, the case management pillar team for developing this uh, presentation. And I know these presentations are undergoing review and probably when we interact with any COVID training in the next month or so, there might be uh, lots of changes to this presentation. I also would like to thank the Lung Institute for their contribution. So thank you very much. And I will stop and take any questions. <laughs>